Later on, we'll get to the son and his brother. But just here again, the response of the father when he recognised he'd done wrong and he returned home. We read that while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. This is how ready God is to embrace us and forgive us and restore us if we turn to him and seek his mercy and forgiveness. No matter how long it might have been that we've been wandering away, he welcomes us back. Well, we are going to sing again. And we're going to sing, You Are My Strength When I'm Weak. How are we doing, Bethany, on? Yeah, we should have it. We should have it. That's fantastic, isn't it? Uh, so let's stand uh, and sing of how we seek after God as our treasure and how he comes to us. ones as they need. Lord, would you please come close to them? Would you teach them through their teachers today more of the wonder of who you are and what it is to follow you, that they might walk with you in the path of light uh, all the way to glory. We ask it, Lord, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay, would you like to take your little ones up? And uh, while they're doing that, why don't we just turn to the people around us, say hello and welcome before we have our notices. No, it seems fine.
Okay, right, let's do uh, some notices quickly, shall we? Okay, what's coming up uh, at Grace Church? Firstly, I understand it was a good time last night, Poppy. Uh, International Women's Day, really good time. Yeah, so I saw some photos online. Looks like, yeah, I did. Is that not intended? Okay. Okay, well, it looked like it was really good fun. So that, that's fantastic. Um, Things coming up this week, as normal, we've got um, our community groups, Impact for uh, Key Stage 1 on Monday, SALT for um, Key Stage 2 on Tuesdays. Go one back. There we are. Um, so we split SALT between uh, Key Stage 3 and Key Stage 4 at different times. Um, and then... Uh, Beyond that, next weekend is the weekend away for Year 9 Pluses with the other Year 9s Plus from Christchurch. So do be praying for that as they go away, I think, to work, Woking or Working Home next weekend. And Tom is speaking at that, so we could be praying for Tom. Um, other things coming up, 22nd on the Wednesday, we've got Parenting Matters, our yearly get-together to think about what it is to be Christian parents. It's at our house. Sunday, um, the 2nd of April, the, we'll then have our next prayer breakfast but the big thing of course is the holiday club which is coming up a week before easter if you haven't signed your children up please do so uh, it'd be great to have as many as possible come along for that but uh tom anything else that i'm missing or Luke, that we should be saying okay oh right yeah yeah, yeah. no no it might get resolved by then but yeah due to be two days of strikes i think this week joy <laughs> right, we're going to carry on. Uh, excuse my daughter. Uh, Rob Bannister is going to come and pray, I think. So let's bow our heads as Rob leads us. Psalm 110 says, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will extend your mighty scepter from Zion, saying, Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your troops will be willing on your day of battle, arrayed in holy splendor. Your young men will come to you like dew from the morning womb. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will crush kings on the day of his, of his wrath. He will judge the nations, heaping up the dead and crushing the rulers of the whole earth. He will drink from a brook along the way, and so he will lift his head high. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a great God. As we come before you, we ask that you'd help us to draw close to you as we, as we come to you, this awesome power. Uh, we, we pray, Lord, that uh, we might be humble before you, that we might recognize your, 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 your mighty presence, your holiness, your righteousness. Uh, and uh, we pray, Lord, that as we come before you, we might bow before you, acknowledging that you are the great God of all things, that you are the one who is mighty and powerful, who rules the nations, who resides over the uh, overall nature and uh, is the creator of all things and we come before you as those who have been washed through the blood of our saviour the lord jesus christ and so have access to 
your ear. And we thank you this afternoon, Lord, that we can come and we can pray and you hear us and you answer in according with your sovereign purposes. Lord, we marvel at that. We are amazed that our voices can be heard in the courts of heaven even right now and our hearts and our thoughts are transported there with you. And we pray, Lord, as we come before you and recognise the, uh, the significance of that, that we might truly bring our needs before you in confidence and with hope, knowing that all that we do, as frail and uh, faltering as it is, is filtered by the blood of our Saviour and the salvation which is ours in him. So we praise you for your grace towards us. We thank you, Lord, that you don't just consume us by your wrath, but you look down upon us and don't see us and our failure, but you see the work of our Saviour. And in that, you are gracious and merciful towards us. Lord, we thank you for the love which you pour out upon us, for the many blessings that we all enjoy within our lives, for the way in which you never take your eye off us, uh, for the way in which you never fail to lead in, in, in uh, accordance with your purposes. And we praise you that our days are numbered and they are in your hands. Lord, we thank you too for your common grace to all mankind. We thank you for uh, the, the many good things that uh, you pour out on civilization. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for all that uh, we are able to accomplish, all that we have. Uh, we, we thank you, Lord, for um, the wisdom that mankind does have and recognize that these are all gifts from you. And we pray that you might indeed cause men and women, boys and girls across this globe to acknowledge the giver of those gifts and uh, come before you and call you Lord. We thank you that you are in charge of the nations, that you are the one who controls all things and we would pray Lord for um, our world and the, the many issues within our world. We pray particularly Heavenly Father for those areas of, uh, of war. We particularly particularly think of the Ukraine again and just ask that you would be merciful in that situation but there are troubles in so many places and we just pray Lord that you'd be merciful and that you'd bless your people wherever there is difficulty or struggle that you would protect them from evil and you'd cause them to be a real blessing in the societies where you have put them Lord we ask that your gospel might prosper that you would cause many to hear the, the truth of your word and as we think about the Easter period soon upon us, we ask that that might be a real opportunity for many to hear your truth afresh, to hear it perhaps in earnestness for the real, real first time. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would be with each of us and, uh, and help us to take hold of any opportunities that, that confront us over this Easter period. But we really pray that you would cause many to have a desire to find out more about the Easter message. We pray, Lord, even for our own locality and those around about us here, that there might be some who are intrigued by the Easter story and, uh, and seek out somewhere to hear more of that. We pray, Lord, that you would be with all of those that minister over this, this Easter time and that you would really bless the truth of your word, whether that is in halls like this, churches across the land, or maybe on, on, on media, across television and radio, we just pray that your truth might resound and uh, that you might use it by the power of your Holy Spirit to change hearts and lives. Lord, we particularly pray for our own activities over Easter and we would pray, pray for the Holiday Club especially. We ask that you bless and be with Tom as he, uh, as he leads that. Uh, we pray that there may be uh, many youngsters that come in and hear your truth over those few days. Uh, we ask, Lord, that uh, we, we might have an influx of those who we don't normally mix with, that we, we might see some new faces and, and build some new relationships over that week. And we particularly pray that you would start a work, even in these young lives, that might resound to, to your honour and glory and reach out into new homes, sharing the gospel truth. So, Lord, we really pray that you would bless that holiday club uh, be with all those who are preparing and organising it. And we pray when it comes that 
you would just multiply your work amongst these youngsters and cause there to be eternal good through uh, that activity, we pray. We think of other things, Lord, within the church. We, uh, we pray for the Huxleys and, uh, again, interviewing for a carer. We really just ask that you would provide the right person, that uh, you would really open that door and, uh, and provide, Lord, as that need exists. We pray for Chloe, too, uh, and the struggles of health that she's been facing. We just ask for your mercy upon her, that you would help her to uh, get over um, that, that trial and that you bless Dan along with Chloe uh, and have your hand upon them, we ask. We pray for Tom leaving us in terms of, of the ministry here and we really just ask that you would open the right doors for him and lead him uh, and provide the funding that is, is necessary for him to uh, complete that doctorate too, we ask, Lord. And we, we ask that you be with the elders as they consider who will replace Tom and uh, interview and um, uh, and consider who uh, might might follow on. We just ask again that your person um, might be provided by you, that uh, that you would go before us in that matter and make things really clear. We pray for parenting matters coming up. We thank you for the many parents here, Lord. We we we, we praise you that this is a noisy church because there are many kids. But Lord, that's such a joy to know that these youngsters are hearing your truth and growing up under the sound of the gospel. Oh Lord, may that just continue. We thank you that there's new babies coming. And we just pray, Lord, that you would build your next generation here. Those that will be stronger than us, that will be more resolved to, to follow your ways and be more earnest with your truth and, and, and more open and prepared to share the wonders of the gospel. Raise up a new generation even amongst us, we ask, Lord. And then we, we just pray that you would bless us as we listen to your word this afternoon. Help us to be attentive and, uh, and open. And we pray again that your spirit might apply your truth to our lives in such a way that will not just impact us now, but impact us through this week and even uh, into eternity. We ask these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Thanks, Rob. Well, musicians are going to come up. We're going to sing again. And the uh, first song actually is um, written by Paul uh, in response to the reading last week. It's something we've really praised God for, but we have musicians that can, can do that. Uh, so Paul's going to teach that to us. Um, and it speaks of God rejoicing over us, and then we'll follow on from that with uh, a good thanks. Just to explain a little bit, so we had um, had this passage in Luke coming up with the prodigal son, and uh, and we had that passage last last week from Zechariah. Earlier on in Zechariah, it says, "Be silent before the Lord God; the day of the Lord is near." It goes on to explain how that's going to be a bad thing for those who are who are wicked. But by the end of the um, by the end of the book of Zechariah, Zechariah and Luke, which is by the way my favourite book of the Bible, um, it changes. Sing aloud. Daughter of Zion, shout, O Israel, rejoice in itself with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. I just thought, this is my favorite book. I better try and make a song out of this. Um, but it's about how, how we, God changes our silence in the song, it comes and brings us back to life in the, in the prodigal son story, which um, we'll be doing now. So let's give it a try. Bring us back with all. 
Father, we do give you thanks and praise that though we are lost and wandering, you brought us home to your Son. We thank you, gracious God, that you have adopted us as your children, that you've made us heirs with him of eternal life, of all that is to come, and that you've given us your Spirit that we might walk with you all our days. We give you such thanks and praise in Jesus' name. Well, please do take your seats. If you can find your way to a Bible, could you turn uh, to page 961? Uh, Nicola is going to come and read to us uh, and pray for us as she does that. Page 961. And if you are uh, uh, year three to year six, now it's time to go out upstairs. If you go up quietly, that'd be brilliant. Thank you. Why you're finding it? I think it's actually page 962, actually. <laughs> right, let's pray. Father God, as we come before you now, we thank you for your presence amongst us. And as we go to read your word, and as Tom comes to teach us your word, we pray that you would open up our hearts, that the word that we would hear today would fall on the good soil of our hearts, that it would take root. And we pray that your Holy Spirit would do the job of enlightening do the job of teaching and really change our hearts today. And Father, I pray for Tom as he comes to teach your word. I pray that you would use him and give him the words to say and also that you would bless him for, the, for his obedience to you. Amen. Amen. So we're going to read from Malachi chapter 3, <coughs> verse 13 to 18, and it's on page 962. You have spoken arrogantly against me, says the Lord. Yet you ask, what have we said against you? You have said it is futile to serve God. What do we gain by carrying out his requirements and going about like mourners before the Lord Almighty? But now we call the arrogant blessed. Certainly, evildoers prosper, and even when they put God to the test, they get away with it. Then those who feared the Lord talked with each other and the Lord listened and heard. A scroll of remembrance was written in his presence concerning those who feared the Lord and honoured his name. On the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty, it will be my treasured possession. I will spare them just as a father has compassion and spares his son who serves him. And you will again see the distinction between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Hi everyone, good to see you all uh, this afternoon or this evening. Um, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 15 verses 11 to 32, as you can see on the screen, and in the Bibles on your seats, that's page 1049, thank you. So, um, yeah, 1049, give you a chance to find that uh, before I read out. Well, people, we've got a handout. Yeah, who would like a handout? If you're under 18, you're ready. If you're over 18, you can ask John for one. Um, be a handout for you to follow the sermon and hands as well. <clears throat> okay, let's read the parable of the lost son. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am, starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. 
So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. The son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the elder son was in the field. When he came near the house, he had music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you gave me, you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fat and calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me, and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad, because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Well, keep that open in your Bibles. It's a familiar story, you may know, um, but an excellent story to be reading at this point in our series on Luke's Gospel. Um, because over the past few weeks, we've been talking about repentance. It's kind of been the thread that's been going through the chapters of Luke that we've been looking at. Um, repentance being this idea um, that we're turning away from sin towards God in Christ. That's been the, the tagline that, that John Huffman provided us with a few weeks ago. This idea that we're trusting not in ourselves, but we're trusting in Jesus and turning away from sin. And amongst all of this talk of repentance, it's really easy to forget that repentance comes within the context of a relationship. When we repent, uh, we're not just saying sorry into the abyss, into nothingness. We're saying sorry to a God that loves us and has created us and wants to be in a relationship with us. Uh, it's a relationship that we're all created to enjoy forever. So the question I always have is who are we repenting to when we repent? Um, I might repent of the, the wrong that I've done, but if I'm not repenting to my loving Heavenly Father, it's easy to repent to like a different kind of God that I have in my head. Often I find myself saying sorry to God and I see him as, as the parent that is stopping me from having fun. And after I say sorry to God, I'm fully convinced and dedicated to doing the exact same thing that I was doing before. But now I've appeased this parent that's been telling me off. Or sometimes I see God as, as the head teacher that is calling me into his office or her office. And after I say sorry, I'll avoid them at all costs in the playground. I'll make sure I don't make any contact for the rest of that year and I'll go back to doing what I was doing before. Well, maybe I'll see God as the, the boss or the manager that pays my wage at the end of the month, but only if I do my job well and if I stay out of trouble. Um, so I do my job, so I get paid, and I'll say sorry if I mess up, but that's kind of the extent of the relationship. <clears throat> I think those are examples of, of ways that we often do see God when we're saying sorry for the things that we've done. And uh, if we see God in these ways, then our relationship with him, if you're a Christian or maybe you're not a Christian yet, and you're just trying to understand kind of what's going on with this God stuff. But if we see God in these ways, then our relationship with him will be one of fear and obligation, uh, one of moving away uh, instead of moving towards, one of fear instead of one of joy and love and the relationship that the Bible seems to call us to with God. Now, thankfully, the Bible tells us a better story than the one I've been describing. In Luke 15, verses 11 to 32, um, the passage that we're going to be looking at, we get one of the most comprehensive pictures of what God is like towards people who are saying sorry to him, towards people who are coming away from their sin and repenting towards God. And when we understand what God is like towards sinners who repent, I'm convinced that all of us gathered here this afternoon will not be running away from God, we won't be treating God like the head teacher, or the parent, or the boss. 
you'll see in a much, much better way as we'll look at now. So I've got two questions for us for this passage that will help us to understand this. They're on the screen, so you don't need to write them down. Um, the first is, how does God feel towards us as those who are asking for forgiveness? And the second is, why do we so often see him differently to the God he is? Which will follow on from the first question. The second question doesn't really make any sense, but it won't, don't worry. So let's have a look at that first one. Um, how does God feel towards us? I want you to picture the scene with me. Jesus is surrounded by people, which at this point in our series isn't a surprise because he's been doing awesome stuff. Loads of people are following Jesus. And notice in verses 1 and 2 of chapter 15 in your Bibles, He's surrounded by two groups of people, um, which was mentioned last week. He's surrounded by tax collectors and sinners, who are like the bad people in society's eyes, and also uh, Pharisees and the teachers of the law, who are the quote-unquote good people in society. Um, Although we'll see in this parable, they're really not so good. And to these people, Jesus describes a man with two sons in verse 11, in this famous parable. Now, having two sons 2,000 years ago, it's a delightful way to start a story. If you had sons, then that was really good news 2,000 years ago because your estate would be secure and your sons would probably look after you when you got old. And it's sad, but 2,000 years ago, having sons was like this really big deal that everyone wanted um, because that's just what the society was like back then. So there's good news at the beginning, but the bad news is that the younger son in verse 12 has decided that he wants his share of the inheritance. Uh, now, this doesn't seem outrageous at first, meet, first reading. Um, I'm like, well, it seems sensible. He's kind of asked his dad for, for the inheritance. But you need to bear in mind that as a general rule of thumb, you inherit money or property from someone after they die. And you generally don't get inheritance before someone dies. So basically, long and the short of it is that this son is saying, Dad, I can't really wait for you to die. Please give me my money, uh, which is heartbreaking. Imagine if you have a child. I don't have one. Um, but I can imagine what it would be like if, if I had a child that said, basically, I don't care about you. You could be dead. That's fine. I just want my money. Um, so give me my money. Get my way. Now, the usual response to this from a father 2,000 years ago, as I'm saying, the society is different and it wasn't great in these ways. But the request would have been met with overwhelming negativity. Um, Tim Keller wrote a book called The Prodigal God, which I would really recommend. It's short as well, which is nice, but it's a book on this parable. And he says this, a traditional Middle Eastern father would be expected to drive the son out of the family with nothing but physical blows. So the son should get what I would refer to as a whooping, okay? He should get like a, you know, a real red hand to the face or to the, the bum, really, is, is what it would have been back then. But this father is not like other fathers. This father honours this son's choice to leave. So already, there's something unusual about the father in this passage, which I want you to have in the back of your mind. This father is not usual. And in the verses that follow, we read that the son has the freedom to go on his way with the inheritance. He travels far away and squanders all of his money on wild living. Just as he runs out of money, the country he's entered into has a famine. So they've got no food. And this younger brother is so down on his luck, so without the money that he'd just been given, that he has to go and get a job. And this, this isn't a nice job. Uh, this isn't, you know, the job that people have in here with that like commute into London at seven in the morning or anything like that. This is a really nasty job. He has to become a pig farmer. And again, bear in mind that the people listening to this parable were Jewish. So the idea of working with pigs would have been disgusting. They would have heard that this son had become a pig farmer, and pigs are disgusting back then because within Judaism they're unclean animals. And this son, the fall from grace is so severe that he's so hungry, he wants to eat the food that the pigs are eating. You can see that in uh, verse 16. He longs to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs are eating. I suppose for us it's the equivalent of working with vermin, or like working in the sewers with cockroaches or rats, and not the cute kind of rats, like the nasty kind uh, that like eat your face if you give them a chance, and you're so hungry that you are just turning over rubbish in the sewer, and kind of eating garbage that is kind of miscellaneous, don't really, really know what you're eating. But that's how hungry you are, and that's how hungry this son is. Now, 
You may have read this passage before. You might be aware of this passage. Um, and you might have realised already that we are all, in a sense, like, or have been like this younger son in this passage. Because every human being has not necessarily turned their backs on their earthly father, but every human being at some point in their lives, as a guarantee, has turned their backs on their heavenly father. Every human being has at some point said to God, I don't want you, I just want the things that you give me, so the things of this world, and as far as I'm concerned, you're dead to me. That is, that is sin at the end of the day, right? Sin is us saying to God that we hate him, we hate his will, and instead of worshipping him, we want to worship the things of this world. Now this parable isn't explicit, but you can bet that the world living this son squanders his money on is probably not too dissimilar to the trappings of sin that we encounter today. You know, money, wealth, power, sex, those are the things he's been seeking goodness from, but he won't find it. But this is where repentance comes in, because he thinks to himself in these verses, in verse 17, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set out and get back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he's getting ready to literally turn away from the life he's been living to get back to God, to get back to his father in this case. But we know that that's meant to be God in our scenario. But what is he going to find? What is this son going to find when he goes back to his father? And what are we going to find when we do the same thing and we repent and we turn towards God again? Well, I'm just going to rush through these, but there are five things that the father does which is just staggering when the son returns. And there are five things that give us a really firm indication of the father's heart towards his son and God's heart towards us as his children as well. The first two indications are found in verse 20 in your Bibles. We read the first one is that the father's watching. But you see, even before the son makes it home, while he's still far off, his father is watching for him. Now, generally, when you're like standing outside your house and you're watching for someone to come, for me it's when like the post is coming or something I've ordered from Amazon or something like that, I'm really excited. But how much more so would it be if you're desperate for, for your son to return home? His father could have just totally turned his back on his wayward son, but he's waiting for him to come home. He's watching, longing for his son to return. And then here's the second one. He runs. Instead of waiting for his son to kind of make the rest of the journey to him, uh, and even though he can already see him, he's probably not that far. The father is so excited, so overwhelmed with compassion for his son, that he has to run to him. He cannot wait. And 2,000 years ago, I'm told this is a very rare thing for, for older men to do. It was like an undignified thing for, for an older man in a society to run. Probably get your tunic dirty as well, your feet, you'd be wearing sandals. Sandals aren't great for running. You try to, it's, it's not easy. But this father is so overwhelmed that his son has returned that he just has to run. All he's concerned with is the safe return of his son. And then we get the third thing he does. He interrupts. Because now it's the younger son's turn, and he opens his mouth to say his prepared speech. He says, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I no longer deserve to be called your son. And he's interrupted. Because he doesn't even get the words out. He was supposed to say, make me a hired servant. But the father interrupts. And he interrupts by saying, quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him, put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. The father interrupts because he's so desperate to welcome his son home. And that brings us on to the fourth thing. He doesn't want a servant, he wants a son. He wants a son, not a servant. He is not going to be a servant, this son, far from it. Servants don't wear the best robes or rings on their fingers. This son is going to be a son once more. It's total reinstatement. He's going to be no worse off having gone wayward and run away from his father. It's a total reinstatement. And it's worth bearing in mind that this is at great cost to the father. Bear in mind that his father has lost a big chunk of his money by giving it to his son, who's then just gone and wasted it. But because of the father's heart for his son, he will once again be a part of his family and he will once again receive inheritance. 
being fully restored, something he doesn't deserve. It's all about the father's love for his son. And then the last one, throws the greatest party. Caesar Frost kind of missed this, but the icing on the cake is that he basically is about to throw one of the greatest parties that the community has ever seen. The elder son hears from outside that there's celebrations going on. Uh, the fattened calf is killed, which would be like this really expensive meal that has been waiting for a time like that. He'd save this calf. Uh, I can't really think of, of an equivalent. Maybe it's like saving uh, like a really nice steak or something that's been aged for 28 days or um, just saving up a really expensive meal that he spent hours preparing, but then times that by 10. That's what this fattened calf is like. It's a beautiful scene. We're not given one, two, three, four things that this father does to show his love for his son in receiving him again. We're shown five, which display the depth and the passion of his love for his lost son. Now, I want to return briefly to the question that we've been asking of this parable, which is how does God feel towards us when we repent, when we turn away from sin to God in Christ? Well, you need to understand that the father of this passage is, is clearly God. It's meant to be a, an illustration of what God is like towards us. And as the one who loves us and created us, he is desperate for us to return. And when we do, when we say sorry, like this son does, for sinning against heaven and against him, we actually find the same five things that we've looked at here uh, in God, unsurprisingly. We read in Luke 19, that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. So he's waiting and looking for our return. We read in Philippians 2 that Jesus left the glory of heaven and humbled himself to become human and then to even death on the cross. Uh, Jesus, in a sense, runs to us like this father does. He doesn't care what anyone else thinks, he just runs to us. And just like the son doesn't need to do work as a servant, he just needs to say sorry and to repent. It's the same for us. Because actually it's not our works that save us. It's Jesus dying for us, giving us his goodness and his righteousness that will allow us to come to him. And then the Father declares us in Christ that we are his son, whom he loves, with whom he's well pleased. And this all came at such a great cost to God and to Jesus. Uh, to, to pay the punishment for our sins, Jesus didn't just run and get his feet dirty. Jesus, he died on the cross died the, the most torrid and awful of deaths. So unjust, so awful to even describe. But he did that for us and he rose again to bring us into the eternal party as well. Because for Christians who trust in Jesus, one day we'll be in heaven. We'll enter into the party where all can hear everyone around celebrating. It will be a reality where the wrong will fade away and Jesus himself will wipe away our tears and we'll be called a son or a daughter of God forever. We won't just be servants. Although we do serve God, uh, we'll be given everything that a son or a daughter is owed, even though we don't deserve it. Let me return to that question once again. How does God feel towards us when we ask for forgiveness? When I read passages like this one, I feel, I feel foolish for just seeing God like the parents stopping you from having fun or the head teacher from calling you into their office or whatever that third one was. Um, the boss, thank you. Oh, it's good that you're listening as well, thank you. The boss that, that we just work for. But at the heart of who he is, God is the loving father who is overjoyed when his children return to him. <coughs> this is true for those who repent for the first time. Maybe you're sitting here and you're not a Christian. Your parents bring you here or You've been here multiple times and you're just not sure. This is true for you. Maybe you consider yourself a prodigal son, but know that there is a God that is going to welcome you home when you just say sorry for your sins. But this is also true for those of us who are repenting and saying sorry for, for the 50th time, for the 100th time, for the 1,000th time. You see, often we look at the prodigal son and we see this younger brother and we think that this is only for those who aren't Christians. And there's a degree of truth in that, but there's also a degree of truth in that actually when we come and gather together on a Sunday, we still repent for our sins, we still make mistakes, we still upset God. But even then, when we come and ask God for forgiveness, this is still his heart for us as his children. We need to remember that God's heart doesn't change. 
I've just got this quote from Dave Orland. Uh, he's a writer, and I've used this before, but I just think it's a fantastic analogy of recognizing that this is how God feels towards you when you say sorry for his sin, for your sins. Not to read it real quick. A compassionate doctor has traveled deep into the jungle to provide medical care to a primitive tribe with a contagious disease. He's had the medical equipment flown in. He's correctly diagnosed the problem, and the antibiotics are prepared and available. He is independently wealthy and has no need for any financial aid. But as he seeks to provide care, the afflicted refuse. They want to take care of themselves. They want to heal on their own terms. Finally, a few brave young men step forward to receive the care being freely provided. What does the doctor feel? Joy. His joy increases to the degree that the sick come to him for help and healing. This is the whole reason he came. How much more of the disease were not strangers but his own family. So it is with us and Jesus. He does not get flustered and frustrated when we come to him for forgiveness, for renewed pardon, with distress and need and emptiness. That's the whole point. It's what he came to heal. He went down into the horror of death and plunged out through the other side in order to provide a limitless supply of mercy and grace to his people. God doesn't change. He is overjoyed. He loves you more than you could ever know. And the next time we repent of our sins and we confess uh, together as a church, uh, remember that. The next time you confess your sins and kind of say sorry to God for them in your own life, Remember that. God feels love and joy for his children when they repent. And when we remember that, your relationship with him, uh, I think will become one where you're, you're drawn to him, not drawn away from him. Now, to finish, I just want to move on to the second question that I had on this. Why do we not see God like this? Because even though I'm saying these things, and even though you might be on board with them, and you're like, yes, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to say sorry to God, and he's my loving father, and this is really good stuff, I guarantee you that within a week, you will start to kind of fade back into this idea of God being the boss or the head teacher or the parent. Well, you see, to find out why we see God like this, we need to look a bit closer at the younger son and the older son and how they see their father in this passage. Let's have a quick look at the younger son. We've already looked at him most of the time that we've had together. But if you look at the younger son, right at the beginning of this parable, he doesn't see his father as a loving father um, that wants to be in a relationship with him. To be honest, he kind of sees his dad as boring. He sees his father as a means to an end, where if he kind of tips his cap to his father, he can then get his inheritance and do what is really fun somewhere else. And we often see God like the younger son does. We see God as the barrier to the life we want to lead. We see God as the parent that is going to stop us from having fun, and we just kind of want to enjoy the things he gives us instead. So what are we to do? Well, in a sense, we need to do what this younger son does. We need to just know that the things of this world will lead us to a feeling of emptiness, to a feeling of nothingness, to a feeling of being hungry for something more, to, in a sense, being so desperate that we want to eat uh, the pig pods. All we need to do is, is hold up the promises of God alongside the promises of this world. And when you actually look at God clearly, and look at the things of this world, you'll see that there is no comparison. That God is the one worthy of your life, worthy of delight. That God, as we've seen in this passage, is the Father that has lavished his love on you in his son Jesus. It is impossible to see God as the, the stealer of fun and the boring God that we, we just need to um, ask for our inheritance from before we can run away from him. God is so much more than that when we see this passage clearly. But we can rectify the younger brother within all of us by remembering that God loves us and welcomes us in. That he is so much better than the things of this world. Now, the older son doesn't have that problem. He's not seeking other things in this world. He's not necessarily seeing his father as this stealer of fun and joy. A different problem. Because as I'm sure you've noticed, the parable, we often finish it in verse... 24. Well, actually, it keeps going for a bit longer in verse 25 to 32. So it's a, it's a, lot, of, a lot of Bible still there. 
But we read why this son, this older son, is actually he's not going to go to the party when his brother returns. We read why in verses 30 and 29, the one before that. Look, says the son, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered his money, your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. So the younger son has worked away for years, never disobeyed his father. So he simply can't understand why it's okay that this, this younger son, um, not his brother, uh, this son of yours can come back so easily. So how does the older son view his father? Well, in his eyes, he's not really a father at all. The older son sees his father as someone to appease. The older son follows his father's rules, so his father accepts him. The older son sees his father as someone who he just needs to follow, um, to do just enough for, so then maybe one day he'll get a fattened calf like his younger brother does. The older son sees his father as one who is holding up a standard that this older son has to reach in order for him to experience any sort of love or benefit or gift. And you know, this is a trap that we all fall into, particularly as Christians. Often we forget that God is a lover, a, a father rather, who loves us. So instead we treat him as the boss at work that gives us our bonus when we try hard enough, or the head teacher that we behave in front of so he won't tell us off. And when we do that, our relationship with God is, is one of give and take. Our relationship with God is one of bitterness. We make God the God that owes us something in response to our good deeds. But when we do that, we forget that it is by grace that we've been saved. We forget that everything God has is ours, simply when we trust in Jesus. It's all because of what he's done on the cross. Just like everything the Father has is already this older son's. Why do we see God as the head teacher or the boss that pays our wage? We do that when we forget that we are just saved by Jesus, when it is nothing more and nothing less than that. When we forget the, the love that the Father has for us, that, that God is the one who has run to us as we've made our journey home, that everything he has is ours. And I think when we understand that, that is what can shake us from service without satisfaction. Uh, it's what can shake us from duty without delight. And it will lead us to repentance with the knowledge that it is not back-breaking rules awaiting us after we repent. It is our loving Father's embrace. Let me ask that question one more time to finish. How does God feel towards us when we repent? He feels love and joy. He's no different to how he is in this passage. God is not a, a fun, hating God that stops us from doing the things we enjoy. God is not a God that loves us primarily because of what we've done. But God is the Father we all need. The one whose loving embrace changes everything. Uh, and as we journey deeper into him, I pray that your relationship will be one where you run towards God and not away from him when you answer these two questions that we've looked at today. Shall we pray? Let's pray. Father, we're sorry when we see you the wrong way. And when we forget that your heart for us as sinners is the one that we find in this passage. That you do not just leave us to wonder, but you run to us at great cost to yourself. And you've given us your son, Jesus, to, to make us right with you. Help us to just trust in him. He is, he is really all we have. Um, but thank you that you are way more gracious than we could ever be. Father, help us to not see you like the younger son does, as, as the God that stops us from doing the things we really want to do, perhaps. Help us to not see you like the older son, as the God that we must appease, the distant God, the angry God that doesn't want to be with us. No, Father, help us to see you as who you are in this passage. Uh, the one whose heart bursts at the knowledge that his children are coming home. Thank you so much for this. Uh, may we be shaped by it and changed by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Tom. Musicians will come up. We're going to sing as we close. Uh, all I have is Christ that reminds us, doesn't it, that it is only because of him.
the son that he brings us as God's children home. So let's stand and sing. was lost in darkness night, yet thought I knew the way, the sin that promised joy in life, and led me to the grave. I have no hope that you would to keep us from falling. Present us before the presence of your glory, blameless and with great joy. And to you, the only God, our Saviour, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion and authority of all time, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Can I ask you all to sit down, please? Um, that's the end of our service formally. If you're not a regular with us at Grace Church and you do need to go, that's absolutely fine, although we will have coffee in a moment. So... I'd encourage you to hang around and spend some time with us. But once a year, um, we have to say something about safeguarding so that the whole church is aware. And the easiest way to do that is to do that in a service. So we're going to do that briefly now uh, before we finish. So if you bear with us just for a few more minutes, that'd be fantastic. 